today's first speaker is Lou May O'Reilly, um, who's a principal research scientist at MIT in computer science and, and AI. She leads the evolutionary design and operation group there. She obtained her PhD from Carleton University. And today's talk is NIT, Integrating Large Scale Partial Cognitive <laughs> Analysis of Data. OK, well, thank you very much for coming to the last session and uh, sticking uh, with me. Uh, this work is co-authored with uh, a postdoc in my group, uh, Kalyan Vera Machinini, who really should be the presenter, but is not. Um, and let me start with an example of the problem. Um, and I'm going to work left to right on this slide. Um, we assume that there's this very, very large data set. Um, I'm showing you here a set of images that perhaps could be on Flickr, uh, but it could just as easily be uh, a multimodal set of text and images and auditory signals. Um, or it could be compiled astronomy uh, observational data. And um, what we're interested in is deriving a clustering on this very, very large data set where we know what, with respect to the subjective bias of a targeted group of people who are going to look at it and judge and, and tell us those clusterings. Right? However, our problem is that no one person can cluster all this data, and we certainly can't ask all the people to cluster the data. So our strategy is going to be to uh, partition the data into overlapping subsets and give, over, give a particular subset to each one of uh, our assessors in this targeted demographic who's going to provide the clustering for us. Then we need to collect up all these partial subset groupings or subset clusterings um, and resolve them and fuse them or knit them together into a clustering that reflects the consensus of this particular population. And when I say reflecting the consensus, what I want to imply there is that uh, that, that consensus clustering should reflect the agreement amongst the people, and it should discount the outliers in that population. Right? Now, I still have a problem, which is if I have a very large data set and I really haven't told my assessors very much. I'm allowing them to take all their domain knowledge and their expertise and bring it to bear to decide how to group the data, then they could actually um, give me data and I could fuse it into a consensus clustering. But if I rearrange the data and I send it back, I could get a different consensus clustering. So I need to iterate in this problem until I achieve a stable consensus clustering. Right? And that's one where regardless of how much more data I present to these assessors, in these subsets, um, the actual consensus custody I've now adapted and updated is not going to change. Okay, so that's um, the problem. We call it NIT. We've also called it resolving subset groupings. There's a version of it that appeared at NIT in 2011 called crowd clustering, and that's way sexier. I really wish we picked it. Um, uh, their particular instance is a little bit different, but you can see that there's different versions of this problem, even just for example. Um, I could actually have this data distributed. And if this data was distributed, um, then there might be constraints on who could see what. And that would change the way in which I iterate and choose subsets for presentation, and it would change the efficiency of the um, iteration uh, in terms of the convergence to something stable. All right? So that's the intuition behind the problem. And the way I'm going to proceed is to, is to just present some terminology and formalizations, show you how we solved it, and then um, we created some synthetic data, a very small set, uh, because of the um, origins with which we've been working on the problem. And I'll show you an empirical evaluation of, of the various strategies for um, iterating. So this is the same picture, but I've just iconized states. And I've got my data set labeled D. The size is N. And that's um, very, very much larger than the size M of the subsets that I'm going to present to my assessors, which I label A sub i, and I've got each of those. And we can assume that there's some ground truth uh, clustering uh, of the data, uh, pi g. And uh, assessors add some sort of noise to that, because they all have their own subjective bias. right? And even that uh, particular um, uh, ground truth could be quite confused, and there would be this ability to cluster it differently just on the fact that things were similar in different ways. right? The bases of similarity are different. <coughs> I'm going to call the clustering that each assessor gives me. Uh, there's a note of C, and I can um, actually code that as a co-occurrence matrix. You know, it's going to be m by m for every element that the agent, has, the assessor has seen, and it's going to have a one if the two items were um, 
uh, paired in, in the same cluster. We'll put it in the same cluster. Um, and when I reserve, resolve the group things, I'll get something called pi c, the consensus, um, at time t, because I'm going to iterate. And when I iterate, the part of the algorithm is going to actually uh, put a probabilistic bias on d, such that when you sample d, you get an appropriate um, subset distribution across the assessors. And we're going to call that presentation um, a query, and it consists of a number of presentation developments. And we're going to do that h times for however big the number of assessors are. And it could be one, or it could be very, very big. Everyone with me? What just happened? OK, so the way to start is to break it down into two pieces. Uh, when I go through the solution, the first thing I'm going to tell you is how I can resolve these groupings or these clusterings. Uh, I also say few things. I also talk about knitting them. And then the second part, I'm going to go through how we can actually iterate here and improve uh, our knowledge until it's stable. And of course, there I want you to have some intuition that we can actually be quite um, active about choosing these elements. And in that case, it becomes an active learning problem in the machine learning uh, realm, right? OK, so to resolve the groupings, if I have to do it, and in fact, um, m is equal to n, then that's a well-known problem in machine learning literature. Um, it's called consensus clustering. There's many different approaches for it. Um, and you know, even if some of those, um, it's it sort of, if some of that um, data, if m approached n by, a, by very close to 90%, there's, there's, a, there's an expectation maximization algorithm that handles it as a missing label problem. But you know, now we're in this case where n is very, very, very large with respect to m. We're thinking less than 10% of the data. Um, so uh, there's a Bayesian approach in this 2011, uh, the cloud testing I mentioned before, uh, which, doesn't, um, which doesn't have to worry about any data, doesn't, uses, uses inference to handle the fact that some data there's no knowledge about in terms of clustering. And our approach is actually coming from sensory science. We're talking about having evaluators look at food products and uh, deciding whether food products are the same. And so in the sensory science about sensory evaluation science community, multi-dimensional scaling is used. I um, mean, it would be very interesting. We've got work on the way to compare these two. Um, this Bayesian approach uh, could have some vulnerabilities because of the sparseness of the data. Um, and this, of course, has some uh, bias introduced as well. And it would be interesting to compare them. We, we have, I'm not going to talk about that today. So if I want to resolve subset groupings, I'm going to do it in three big, big steps, and I'm going to show you the details inside. First, I'm going to take that assessor information, which is their co-occurrence matrix. Each one of them gives me for the M elements they clustered. And I'm going to prepare it so that um, uh, into something called a cross-product matrix, cross product matrix, so that I can then aggregate all the cross-product matrices across every assessor for the whole panel of assessors. Um, and I need to do that with some sort of weighting so it reflects what I'm talking about. The fact that I really want that consensus to mean where there's agreement, I get more, 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 more implications, and where there's uh, outliers, I discount. OK, and once I can do that aggregation, then there's a way, a very straightforward way um, uh, of doing consensus clustering from that aggregated cross-product matrix. So let me take you through how we prepare the assessor information. Uh, the first thing we do is we uh, have received an M by M matrix from every assessor. Of course, there's a different set of M elements for each assessor. So what I do is I have to register those M elements onto the entire N by N uh, matrix of elements. And uh, I simply, you know, on the co-occurrence matrix, I have a one where any two elements are placed uh, together. And if I uh, split that, by inverting the ones and zeros, then I get a distance matrix. OK? Um, and now, a uh, uh, standard step of uh, multidimensional scaling is that I'm going to um, transform that distance matrix um, into a cross product matrix. And what that involves is I'm simply centering the, the matrix and I'm normalizing it with the first eigenvector. And, um, and what I get out now is an n by n matrix for all the elements, but its real value is not discrete anymore between ones and zeros. Okay? So I'm going to call that the cross product matrix. And now, what have I got? For every panelist, I have a cross product matrix. And I want to aggregate them. And remember, I want to aggregate them 
uh, with a weighted assess, with a weighted aggregation, not something like averaging. That means I want to put emphasis on where they agree. So what I can do is I can actually take the correlation between any one of those cross product matrices. And I'll do that for everything, everybody. And that gives me another matrix which has the RV or the correlation coefficients of that, of that test. Okay. What I can then do is I can treat that RV matrix as a new feature space. Right? It's the feature space that tells me about agreement. And I can do PCA on that. And in, with PCA, I can actually uh, um, extract with the first two principal components or the, uh, or, or the important principal component um, a way of mapping this down to a set of, of weights for each um, assessor. And you know, details I can show you offline, but the idea is that I want to weight the panelists who agree with each other more, their cross product matrix, than the ones who are outliers. Right? And so you're going to see that in the next step. This is my, this is my cross correlation, my correlation testing against everyone, which gives me an RV. Uh, and then the PCA, and then the flattening into one of space, which gives weight to every panelist, every assessor. And here you just see that uh, you know I've created a, a, what I would call the, the global cost product matrix. And that's just the sum of everybody's cost product matrix with their own particular weight that I got from that previous test. And uh, next step I have to do, if you recall, is I have to take this global consensus, this, this sort of consensus cost product matrix, and I need to turn it into consensus clustering. And that's very standard. I'll just do a spectral clustering method. I'm going to run it through PCA and run through any of your favorite uh, clustering algorithm with the principal components, and I get back now the skewed um, consensus clustering. Okay, so I've, I've, I've given you the solution to the first step in the problem. That's a quick review of it. But my next challenge is to figure out logic for that iteration so that I can actually know that I've achieved a stable consensus clustering. Um, and that's going to mean two things. I need to form the, the next set of, of, part, of presentations. Um, and I want to do that so I convert as quickly as possible um, with this consensus that sends it to the agreement. And of course, I need to know when I'm going to stop and when I'm stable. And the, the, the halting criteria is very easy. Uh, what I can do is use mutual information. I can take the, uh, the, the co-occurrence matrix that represents the consensus, consensus clustering at time p, and I can compare it to the one in the previous step. And if the mutual information is very high, then it's not changing much. So under some threshold, I'm going to decide how to change that. Now, of course, my algorithm is, is sensitive to that epsilon. Uh, but I'll show you that it's very consistent. Uh, uh, this notion of, of uh, stability with mutual information is very consistent with um, convergence of accuracy uh, with respect to the ground truth of cluster. So let's go back to thinking about um, the problem of selecting the next set of elements Uh, to uh, see what happens, right? And we're going to call this, I'm going to refer to this as active learning because, uh, with adaptive sampling. And that's because uh, if you look down here, I'm going to basically form a, a distribution on the original data. And once I, uh, sorry, I'm going to form a distribution. I'm going to use that distribution to sample the data set D to come up with these queries that I send back to the assessors. And I need two pieces of information. And in this, in this talk, I'm going to tell you about information that's pairwise. It's just telling you how what, whether two elements in the data set have been clustered together, that you put in the same cluster or not. Now, that's not all the information I have, but today I'm just talking about that. Okay? And if I want to use that information, I'll break it down into two uh, pieces of data, of, of, uh, uh, two, 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 things, two things. A C, which is my pairwise co-occurrence matrix, which tells me for any two elements if they actually got <coughs> clustered together how many times. And then my pairwise presentation matrix, which is telling me just how many times I actually gave them to an assessor together, right? Because they may not have actually been presented a, a large number of times. So with that information, uh, the first two strategies I can tell you about are very basic. One is just random. I don't do anything that I wasn't doing before. And that can be our baseline. Uh, but a little bit uh, smarter, but still not easy strategy, is what we can do is we can just go to the presentation matrix and we see how often did you sample everything. And let's just sample things that an even amount to a, you know, a, a uniform level. And to do that, I just have to look at the presentation matrix and uh, map that to a probability distribution and use that probability distribution to uh, sample or to bias the sampling on the data set. And I call that an exploration strategy. 
Uh, but what will probably come to your mind if you spend a little bit of time scratching your head about this is there's more information out there. You know which elements have been placed, you, you know that elements have been placed pairwise, and you can go back to the data and you can see how many times they were placed together and how many times they were placed apart. And no matter how many times I tell you uh, how many times these guys have actually been sampled, if they've been placed a lot frequently together, then I'm actually pretty sure that they stay together. But if they've been placed apart, I'm also pretty sure that they're going to consistently be placed apart. What worries me is the ambiguous information I get back for a pair, for a particular pair of, of elements. Um, and uh, that ambiguous information is going to be that sometimes they were together and sometimes they weren't together. So I can very quickly uh, come up with an index over each pairing of elements, which is just the frequency with which something has been paired together given how much it's sampled. Okay, and that number is going to be between 0 and 1. And because I really don't want the guys near 0, I don't want the guys near 1, I want to sample, um, I'm good. Uh, I want to sample the ones that are ambiguous that are near 5. So I just have to map um, this EI to an index that sort of transforms this number uh, through a Gaussian transformation. Um, and now I get an ambiguity index, which basically says, you know, when ambiguity is high, uh, that's what I want to sample, and when ambiguity is low, it's not what I want to sample, and it, it picks out those um, elements that are at the, around 0.5, and if I control the standard deviation of my Gaussian, I can sort of see with what respect I influence whether I pick things at the tail or in the mean, near the mean. Okay, so now I have these strategies, and the problem with <coughs> exploiting is that I may have seen, I may have seen uh, a pair of elements placed, two, two different pairs of elements placed together four times, uh, sorry, with, 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 probability, with frequency 0.4, but some may have been sampled together 100, and some may have been sampled together, just present, I'm sorry, presented together twice, right? And I really want to spend more time on the ones that I haven't seen very often, even though they look, I'm about, there, there's an ambiguous as the other pair. Um, and the other problem I have is that sometimes the data can just be confusing. And I could sit there and I could hammer away at those ambiguous pairs, and they're going to stay ambiguous. It's actually not going to get cleared up because people are going to continue to confuse them, right? So that it sort of indicates I need to uh, mix my exploring and exploiting. And in that case, what I'll do is I'll pick an element, and when I want to pick which pair, which element I pair it with for a presentation, if that I'll, I'll form a set of elements which are below some ambiguity index and which are below some frequency of presentation threshold. And I'll probabilistically um, weight them and, and use them for the, the, the paired product. Um, and then I'll take that new product I picked and I'll, and I'll iterate. So that will help me sort of negotiate between you know, things that are really ambiguous and still not sampled enough. And, and if there's none there, then what I'll just do is I'll randomly pick between, between trying to resolve my ambiguity or sample more. OK? And let me show you some results. And, and you know, this latter method is problematic. We're still going to think about it more. Because there's some, there's some parameters there that we're going to be sensitive to. And, and in these results I'm going to show you, we didn't tune it at all. And that might explain why, for some things, we, we don't, um, uh, this mixed method doesn't work as well as um, just exploiting, right? Exploiting the, uh, uh, the knowledge you have about item ambiguity. So the first question you can ask is say I put away the ground truth, um, but I allow a clustering on all the data. That's what I call complete here. And I um, fix the number of presentations. I don't worry about stopping my iterations with stability. Um, and I look at uh, the quality of the final consensus with respect to that ground truth. So I look at the mutual information between my final consensus and the ground truth. Um, and I compare that with um, uh, exploit and explore. And what happens is you see that if I actually get the consensus clustering with my method, um, for sorting, uh, for clustering all the data, this gap here is representing the noise coming from assessors. This gap here is, is representing the noise coming from the fact that I have exploited the strategy, and it's only seeing partial amounts of data. And this gap here is the difference between the two methods. Right? And what's really interesting is they change, they cross here. And what's going on here, um, and this is what's going on here, is is happening because the difficulty of my problem actually gets harder as I go this way. That's my difficulty index. Sorry about that. But why do these things cross here? It's because I only allowed 500 presentations of the data. It's a very small data set. Um, but because of that, the complete data set couldn't get enough information. But if I was hurrying up and exploiting as I, as I, as I 
as I, as I looked at uh, form of consensus, then I actually managed to do better because the partial bit that was seen was actually intelligently picked instead of ra randomly picked. Uh, finally, you can compare the strategies. So what we found uh, for just a very small set of data, 100 points because we're working with um, uh, sensory uh, evaluation type data, and we looked at giving each panelist eight products, which is only 8% of the data. And what we did, though, in this, in this comparison is that we allow updating um, active learning every time we visit one assessor. That's why H is equal to 1. And what you can see is if we're continuously learning without any sort of batch processing of the data, then we see a significant uh, advantage to using um, ex exploitation. And um, the reason the mixed one is probably not working as well is we haven't tuned that balance, those, those parameters in it. And what you see is that if the, the data becomes harder, we're not going to get as good an accuracy in terms of mass mutual information with ground truth. Um, and in fact, you start dropping off here, and everything starts to look the same. All right? So uh, two more slides. Uh, we also experimented with just showing, proving to ourselves that if you learn rapidly versus learning, learning in batches, um, the uh, quality of your answer, uh, the convergence to a stable solution takes longer, but it doesn't change the ranking of the different uh, active learning strategies. And then we actually just looked at our halting criteria. We just wanted to show that you know, there's, a, there's a, a match between the performance improvement and finding stability in the data. So to close, um, we still have lots of work to do because we just looked at the data um, at a small scale. But what we'll go away and do is um, approximate the matrix algebra, because this is all algebraic. Um, consider different versions of the strategy. And the thing we haven't done is if we haven't looked at whether there's information in the current clustering. Right? We've just looked at pairwise information. It would be very interesting. We, we've tried some things. Um, nothing is working better than pairwise. Um, so that's a, a, a piece of active research for us. Thank you. Yeah, I did not understand exactly if the different subsets uh, um, corresponding to the different uh, assessors are overlapping or not. Yes, they have to be overlapping. Well, they will, yes, they're overlapping. They have to cover the whole data set. Yes, but so they can overlap between yes. two assessors. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's sort of sampling with replacement. And we really have to be a little careful about some of the things we're saying. If you go back to our notes and our, and our details, uh, because you're doing sampling with replacement, you have to be a little bit careful with some of these distributions. And I mean, you some thoughts on how you might approach the a multi label problem. So, I, I imagine if you give people a bunch of images, they're all going to think about, and you got to tell them what the real question is. Some people are going to cluster things by color or some by animal, dead or alive, whatever, right? So, if you're not, if you're asking them to use their domain knowledge, but you're not telling them essentially a zero one label question, mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you discover? Those sorts of relationships. Two the bases? Well, look, well, the, the, in fact, the assumption here is that I don't even know the features, right? I don't actually, uh, I assume that, that there's some underlying way of characterizing the data that's being um, used by the assessor, but I don't have that feature information. That's, that would be my assumption here. If I could pair it with that feature information, then I could integrate the feature information later into the results of the clustering. I could basically regress out each cluster, right? 